Welcome everybody. We will be starting in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in chat. Would love to know where you're from, what is your name, and especially what brings you here today. Wow, we've got people from Mexico, Nigeria, India, California. Fantastic to have you here. Kazakhstan, Philippines. Got people from all over the world. It's so great to see you. Turkey, India, Bangladesh, Egypt. I'm not going to be able to catch everyone because there is a lot of people saying hi, which is absolutely fantastic. We'll get started officially in a minute. In the meantime, if you want to share what brings you here today, I'd love to know about that as well. Excited to learn. Somebody who is unemployed, somebody is looking to get help for their child who is graduating. Curious, that's always a good reason to go. Fresh graduates as expected as well. Looking for a first job, perfect. So it looks like there is a few people who are <laughs> there is a few people who are unemployed, looking for first job, graduating college, job hunting can definitely be a struggle. Completely understand that. Wonderful. Um, I um, I'm going to officially introduce myself now and kick off our conversation. As, uh, as I'm talking, I am not going to be monitoring the chat because I want to make sure that I focus on communicating with you through the webinar. However, we have a couple of wonderful team members from Coursera um, monitoring the chat. And they will, be, um, they will be helping to sort of moderate the questions that come in. So we are going to have time for questions at the end of this webinar. Please, uh, if you can, put your questions into the Q&A feature. So you will look, uh, if you look at your Zoom and you mouse over the different options in Zoom, you will see that there is a button that's called Q&A and that's where you should be uh, putting your questions that you want me to answer at the end of the webinar. As I said, after I'm done with the presentation, uh, the team will help me uh, moderate those and, and select the questions that I'm able to answer. But we will be looking at that Q&A feature because if you put your questions in chat, they're probably not going to get noticed, as you see it, which is fantastic. There's a lot of conversations happening. Please keep talking in chat. Again, questions that you'd like me to answer at the end, please put them in the Q&A feature. Okay, so uh, let's get started. My name is Vera Fishman. I manage career services at Coursera. And over the past five years or so, I have done a lot of work with people in all kinds of career transitions. So I've worked with people uh, who, are, who have lost their jobs. I've, lost, I've worked with people 
who are getting education or online training and looking for their first job. I've worked with people moving um, into the next step of their career. I've worked with people in career transitions um, and all kinds of all kinds of job searches. So I have, you know, I've led webinars, I've worked uh, for com consulted with companies, I've worked with clients one on one as a career coach in different capacities. And over, as I said, over the past years, I probably touched, I've lost track, but a few thousand people, some of them are in the uh, Silicon Valley where I live, some of them across the United States, and some of them across the world. So I've seen it all when it comes to the job search, and I've seen patterns, and I've seen um, successes, lots of successes that people have, as well as the challenges that people have. So I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about finding your first job. Uh, finding your first job can be daunting. It's a huge step in your career. It's also a step that everybody has to take at some point of time. And I've seen thousands of people take it. So you're, you're in a good path. But I want to make sure that you're as effective in that process as you can be. And you're really putting your best foot forward, especially right now. I know these are stressful times. I know those of you who might be in college and we're expecting to get internships. A lot of internships got canceled this summer. A lot of changes are happening. A lot of companies are shifting how they're hiring. Some companies are hiring, some companies are not. It adds just additional stress to this situation. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about how you can feel more confident in a very, um, in a very practical way. What are the steps that you can take to know exactly what you're doing in your job search, what job you're looking for, and how you're going to get there. And by the way, when I say your first job, uh, for a lot of people, it's going to mean, just like we've seen in chat, it's first job after college. For some people, some people uh, might not be going to college and just looking for their first job. For some people, it might be their first job in a new field. So maybe you have experience, but you're changing careers, you're looking for a first job in the new field. Um, I am going to assume that because uh, you are here for a Coursera webinar today, that you have some sort of experience with online learning. Chances are you have something uh, that you want to share with your employer about the online learning. So I will have a little bit of focus on that today. However, everything we will discuss is absolutely transferable across different uh, backgrounds. So let's get started. Um, there will be kind of a couple of parts to this presentation. We will begin with talking about your target role because, believe it or not, that is actually the biggest gap that I've seen in people looking for their first job. They think they know what they're looking for, but they might not actually know enough to be successful. Um, and then after that, of course, we will talk about you and how do you put your best foot forward. As I said, we will have a Q&A at the end, so please do put your uh, question in the Q&A feature and the team will be monitoring so I can address as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's get started about and talk about the job. You might think that it's a little bit strange that I'm um, I'm, I'm instead of talking about you, I'm starting with a job. But as I said, it's the biggest gap that I've seen in people looking for their best job. For, sorry, for their first job, they think that they know what they're looking for, but in reality, they don't. Um, they don't know what day to day in the job looks like. They don't know, you know, how many meetings a day do you go to? Do you go? Um, do you work alone or do you work with people? Um, Usually, who defines your work? If you are, say, a data analyst, um, do you work on a single project, large project at a time, or do you want work on multiple projects? What are the imp most important skills that you have? What are um, what is surprising? What are the soft skills? What do you need to be passionate about to be successful in, the, in that job? So all of those questions are really important. And the reason those questions are really important is because fundamentally, in the job search process, you are trying to convince your future employer that you are exactly the right person to do the job. But if you don't know what that person needs to be, how can you possibly do that. 
So again, uh, before you start putting together your resume, reaching out and apply to jobs, going to interviews, because before you do all of that, you need to make sure to do your research on the job. And these are the, this slide just shows some, some examples of questions you should be asking, right? What is the day-to-day -day like? What are the skills you need? Um, maybe what are the other jobs that are similar? Sometimes uh, there are similar job titles, right? There is, for example, business intelligence and business analyst and uh, data analyst. Those roles are, can be similar, although they can be also very different. Um, also, how do you get started in the field, right? Again, if you're looking for a first job, you're at a point that every professional goes through in their life. But what, how do you get to the other side and actually start your career? Now, you might hopefully you agree with me that those are all great questions to ask. But I also realize that you might be feeling that this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. How can you possibly know the answers up to these questions if you've never had this job? And the good news is there is a solution. And solution is talking to professionals in the field. So you might have or might have never heard of a term informational interview. If you've never heard of the term, don't worry about it. All an informational interview is, is a conversation with an industry professional about their real life experience working in the job. So think of it as more of a journalistic interview rather than a job interview, right? Imagine you're a journalist, you interview an industry professional to understand what it is um, their job is like. What is their experience working in that job? Okay, ho so hopefully at this point of time, you also agree with me that this is a good idea, but you might ask me the next question is, how do you actually talk to those people? And especially, I'm now suggesting that you talk to more than one. And by the way, it is important to talk to more than one person because every person is going to have a different experience. It's going to depend on their experience, on the company they work at, maybe on their industry, just a lot of factors there. And because you probably don't know exactly what company you're going to work at, it's important for you to understand uh, different, uh, different ways that this particular role you're looking for might look. So you're looking to talk to 10 people with the same job title and potentially ask them the same question. Great, again, so you might be on board with me suggesting that you talk to 10 people. How do you find them? Uh, the reality is it's easier than it seems. There, so first of all, I want to tell you that this is, yes, this is definitely a networking conversation. We're going, we're, I'm suggesting that you network and you step out of your comfort zone. Uh, I know a lot of people I work with come to me and say, hey, I am not comfortable talking to strangers. And that's okay. The reality is majority of people are not comfortable talking to strangers, but it also doesn't mean that you're not capable of it. It's actually, again, it might be easier than it seems. People are very friendly. Again, beautiful thing about informational interviews is you're not going in asking for a job. You're going in asking for information, asking for advice, asking for help. And a lot of people out there would love to help, especially, again, we're going through difficult times. So how do you find those people? There's a lot of options. Online, internet is great for that. Facebook group, Google your area, uh, sorry, not Google, uh, enter into a search bar on Facebook your area and enter job search networking. There's a lot of groups where professionals can connect. You can then post in those job uh, in those groups and see if there are, job, uh, there are people who are in relevant jobs who would be willing to talk to you. LinkedIn groups. Lots of groups, again, uh, based on professional interests. So for example, if you want to be in digital marketing, go to LinkedIn, do a group search, search for digital marketing, see what groups come up, post there, see if uh, somebody's willing to talk to you. Go through a list of individuals who are members of that group as well. Maybe reach out to them directly. Meetup.com, uh, especially in the United States, is a great website for, in for meeting people in person. And 
fortunately, this is not a great time for meeting people in person, but still you can find people that way. If you go to meetup.com, you can search groups there. They're usually based on interest. So you can search job search uh, or you can search uh, specific area, your industry that you're looking to go into and see uh, who is there. Eventbrite, any other ticketing websites, you can search for events there. This is a great way to find uh, networking events. And then finally, industry organizations. Um, for example, Project Management Institute is an industry organization. There are ways usually to connect with community members. That's a good place to find project managers, for example. And then finally, uh, last but not least, is my personal favorite, LinkedIn. So the reality is, uh, there is a lot of professionals, whatever role you're going after, there's a lot of people already working in that role. And I can absolutely guarantee you there is a lot of people working in that role um, in your area. Well, there are some exceptions, but for most of you, that's going to be the case. Beautiful thing is that almost all of those professionals are going to be on LinkedIn. So if you go to LinkedIn uh, and you put do a search in people and you put your target job title, so data analyst, for example, and you put your location, and I, I put San Francisco Bay Area because that's where I live, then you will see all of those people show up in searches. As you can see, there's 170,000 people who show up in as data analysts in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people you can talk to. That's a lot of people you can reach out to. And uh, that's a lot of people to choose from. So I do this all the time. I'm just not just suggesting that. Start going through those profiles. Open up hundreds of profiles. Go through them. See who are the people that you would like to talk to. Specific things to look out for are people who have similar background to you, right? Maybe they're just one step ahead. Maybe they just completed college. And so are you, you're about to complete college, finish college. And then they started their first job, the type of job that you're looking for. Maybe they have similar background in different ways. Maybe you have shared interests that you discovered. Maybe you're both passionate about um, improv or do music outside of business hours. Um, also look for people who have well-developed profiles. If they have well-developed profiles, that means that they are much more likely to be open to connection because they do want to network. And so once you find people that are, that you would like to talk to, send them a connection request. You don't, you know, you don't need emails on LinkedIn. You don't need to pay for that necessarily. What you can do is send them a connection request, include a note, a personal note in your connection request, and explain to them why you're reaching out. I have a sample here. Tell them that uh, their background looks interesting and you would just like to ask them a few questions. If they accept your connection request, make sure to follow up and request a conversation. Now, keep in mind that you might send 10 connection requests. Maybe you'll send 30 before somebody responds to you. That's okay. It's, that it's, it's not that you were doing something wrong. It's just that sometimes people don't monitor their LinkedIn. Sometimes people get busy. There are all kinds of reasons. But uh, you do just keep reaching out to people. Again, you know, 170,000 people in the San Francisco Bay Area with data analyst experience. There is not going to be a shortage of people. If you reach out to 500 people even uh, and get five conversations out of it, you are in great shape. But realistically, you're going to get more than five conversations out of 500 invitations. Now, let's assume you've gone through that step and you reach out to the person and you've set up uh, your informational interview. First of all, congratulations. Second of all, now it's the time to prepare. Make sure you go into those conversations prepared. Research the person and their background. You probably already know quite a bit about them because you chances are you looked them up on LinkedIn. Research their company, kind of get a sense of what it's like to work at that company, and then research uh, their, their role. And when I say research the role, Research the role in general, not necessarily at that company. So go to your favorite job board and pull up 10 job descriptions with your target job title. So again, let's say it's data analyst. Pull up 10 job descriptions uh, with a job title data analyst. Kind of go through it and see what questions come, 
come up. Um, maybe you will see that um, everybody requires a four-year degree and you don't have a four-year degree. What do you do? Maybe you will see that everybody requires experience. And again, you're looking for your first job. What do you do? Maybe you notice that requirements are actually very different across different jobs. So what do you do with that information? These are all great questions that you're going to be able to ask people you interview. And I recommend that you, when you have these informational interviews, have questions that you're going to ask every single person so you can compare their answers and also have questions that are personal to them that really show appreciation for their time and their experience. Once you complete this uh, exercise and you conduct all of those informational interviews, you're going to be in great shape. You will essentially know everything that a person working in this role knows about the role. So you'll be a, in a great position to uh, explain why you're such a great candidate for the role. You'll know what skills are required, what personal qualities are required, what experiences, what education, and it will, trust me, it will just make you feel much more confident going into that job search. All right, so we've talked about the role and let's assume at this point of time, you know everything there is to know about the role. You have all of your questions answered. Let's shift gears and actually talk about you and what you're bringing to the table, to the employer and how you position yourself for that. First of all, um, even when you're thinking about yourself in the context of the job search, Keep in mind that you should always have the employer's perspective in mind. At the end of the day, everything you communicate about yourself and in your job search is for the benefit of the employer. So think about what is important to the employer, what we had just discussed in the previous step, and think about whenever you share information, why are you sharing each piece of information? And what I mean by that, we uh, often, I, I find that people think about um, information in a very binary terms, right? Like I have a degree or I don't have a degree. However, if you think about any kind of degree or certificate, it's much more than just a certificate. So let's, let's take an example. Let's imagine you have a certificate from Coursera. A lot of people, what they do with that certificate is they put that certificate in the education or certificate section of their resume, and that's the end of it. However, that certificate shows much more than, than just the certificate. It shows the skills that you have developed, right? At the end of the day, most people take any kind of course that go through education for the skills. Um, it shows personal accomplishments. If you're doing any kind of online training, that shows, that shows grit that shows determination, that shows that you're able to work independently and set your own timelines. A lot of important personal qualities. Um, also, as a part of those trainings, you all often complete projects. And while projects uh, are different than work experience, it is hands-on experience that you might be able to demonstrate to employers. So what I'm suggesting is when you're sharing information such as your training, for example, understand what it is that is actually important to an employer about it and make it easy for the employer to see that value. And by the way, I realize I use the word skills a few times by this point of time, so I just want to clarify what I mean by that. Um, and skills are, it's, you know, really pretty straightforward. Here's the definition of the skills. It's the ability to carry out a task with determined results often within a given amount of time, energy, or both. So it's essentially what you can do. And there are two main types of skills that come up in the job search process. One is hard skills. We often call them technical skills. It's something that is very, can be easily tested and easily defined. A lot of the times, those are going to be skills such as you know, programming, um, any kind of hardware skills, those are technical skills, but it goes beyond that, right? Like technical writing or data analytics, project management, again, those are specific skills, specific things that you can do. And then there is a second type of skills, which is soft skills. Uh, and 
it's not about what you do, it's more about how you do the work. It's your communication skills, ability to manage people, ability to manage time, etc. Team planning. Now, the thing about soft skills is they're very important. Depending on the role, they might be, in some roles, soft skills are more important than uh, technical skills or hard skills. However, the challenge with soft skills is they're harder to uh, measure. So whenever you're thinking about your soft skills, make sure that you are thinking about them in more measurable ways, that you show examples of those skills whenever you talk about them. So for example, um, if you're applying for a role in customer support, it, you clearly need good communication skills. Also, that is pretty obvious to everyone that you need to have good communication skills if you're applying for customer support. So what that means is whoever is applying to that role is going to say that they have great communication skills. Now, what if you really do have superb communication skills better than everyone else? Think what what information you can use to support that. For example, maybe, um, maybe you worked as a waiter at a busy restaurant and you have experience managing large loads of customers. Maybe uh, you were a math tutor, right? And you are used to breaking down concepts to students and explaining those concepts. Maybe you were on a debate team. Whatever it is, whatever makes you believe that you have superb, better than average communication skills, make sure to include that. Don't just say communication skills, because again, soft skills are hard to manage and everybody claims those soft skills. Okay. So now I'm going to take you through an exercise of how to actually identify what you want to be communicating to an employer. And uh, what I'm going to encourage you to do is and not right now, but on, 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 your time, on your own time, is go ahead and uh, start recording everything that you bring to the table as a professional. So think about, these are the different areas that you can be thinking about, right? Think about your technical or your hard skills. And I have some examples here, right? I ended up with a profile of a person that is probably not a real person because they have a variety of different skills and experiences, but we'll pretend this is a real person. So they, you know, they know uh, Microsoft Office, Python, project management, have other tech skills. I just added um, tech skills one, two, three, to show that there's probably more than that. We've talked about what technical skills are. We've talked about what soft skills are. Uh, personal quality, right? Personal qualities are a little bit different from uh, soft skills. And personal quality have to do with the kind of person you are. So maybe you are a very responsible and punctual person. Maybe you're passionate about social justice. Whatever it is, maybe you're passionate about an environment. Make sure um, to highlight those things because your personal qualities might be relevant in your job search as well. Education, again, whatever it, education you have, whether it's com a complete degree, an incomplete degree, whether it's a, it's a degree or a certificate or an individual course, whatever it is, include that. Experiences. Now, again, because we're talking about getting your first job here, I don't want you to limit your experiences to your professional experience. Yes, definitely. Write down your professional experience. Those are important. But think about other experiences you've had in life that, that are significant as well. Maybe you were uh, volunteered as a youth educa educator, for example, right? Maybe you spent six month tra months traveling the world. Maybe you were a caregiver to a child, a parent, anyone else in the family. Those experiences shape who we are and can be absolutely transferable um, a lot of the times onto your work. So make sure to write down your experiences. And then finally, accomplishments. Um, and accomplishments are the things that you've done that you're proud of. And um, accomplishments can be professional, right? For example, improved client satisfaction ratings by 10% by optimizing processes. They don't have to be professional. Maybe they're, you've completed online certification while working full-time. We've talked about that. That shows grit and a lot of other 
um, important qualities. Maybe you run, run the Boston Marathon or any other marathon, a triathlon. Again, it shows grit, it shows determination, it shows passion for life. Those things might be relevant to the employer. So at this point of time, I'm encouraging you to think about everything in your life. And as a next step, we're going to go and talk about now, how do you decide what you should be sharing with the employer, what, what you shouldn't be sharing with an employer? And the way to do that is to compare your profile that you came up with to your target job requirements. So in this example, I'm using the same uh, person that I described on the previous slide. And I'm using an entry-level analyst role at a school district now. It doesn't have to be in a school district, but there was some use to that information in this example. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. This is how you do it. You uh, take your target role requirements and go through them one by one. So for example, you will see uh, that this person, uh, they need somebody to, who knows Excel, and you will see comparing that to your profile, you know uh, Microsoft Office, which Excel is a part of. So I'm going to assume you know Excel. Great, there is a match. Highlight that in green. They require that the person knows Tableau. There is no, you doesn't look like you know Tableau, so I'm going to mark that in red. You have some other skills, Python project management and R. Both Python and R can be used in analytics. So I'm marking them in yellow because they're potentially adding value, but not directly. Um, what is asked in the job. Project management, again, is not something that is highlighted, but uh, might be relevant. Keep going. Soft skills, um, team player communication skills. Yes, team player is there. Communication skills is not there, but again, you probably have good communication skills, I hope. So you need to make sure that you communicate that somehow. Um, you're great, you have great attention to detail. It's not required, but it's hopefully going to be helpful in the job as well. Personal qualities, uh, detail-oriented, uh, self uh, is not something that you've listed in the qualities. Self-motivated, have grit, and that is actually something that you do have because you have, um, you have completed uh, some online certificates. You just haven't communicated that way. But again, this is something that you have um, passion about education under you. I'm marking in green, even though it's not required because that's going to be relevant that this role is at a school district. But passion about the environment that you are is actually not relevant. Education, uh, bachelor degree is relevant. Statistics with our course, again, can be relevant because it has to do with analytics. IT support, probably not relevant. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me go back to that slide. Oops. Um, experiences, you don't have two years of relevant work experience, but you have worked as a marketing associate and as youth education volunteer, which can be relevant. And then accomplishments. Accomplishments are probably not going to be listed in the job description. So your accomplishments that you've put together, just go through them and compare them to the requirements. As a result, you are now going to have this uh, list with green, red, and yellow in it. What's important is, that, look at the target roles. If there is anything that's in red, those might be gaps you need to close. And for example, uh, you can do that, a lot of gaps you can close using Coursera courses. Um, if you're a student, especially right now, you can access Coursera's catalog for free. Um, and that can be a great tool. So Tableau, you can probably find a course in uh, Coursera for Tableau. Um, so again, look at the red, then look at the column with you in it, and look at the green and red. Green are the points that are going to be your selling point. Those, that's the most important information you want to communicate to the employer. Red are the things that are not relevant to your employer. So those are the things that you are not going to want to talk to that employer about because it's just going to confuse them, right? Of course, there is value to the fact that you received an IT support certificate, but if somebody is hiring you for an 
analyst, it's not going to be relevant to them. It's as important to know what you shouldn't be talking to your employer about as it is to know what you should be talking. Because often people think that any experience, anything you bring to the table is of value, but for somebody who's looking to hire you, it might just get confusing. So again, make sure that you, are, uh, you go through this list and you're very aware of what your talking points are. All right, so now at this point of time, you know what it is that you shouldn't be highlighting to your employer and what it is that you want to be highlighting. And you know this about yourself, but let's talk in a more tactical way. How do you share that information with your potential employer? And um, I'm going to talk about your main job search marketing materials, which are resume, LinkedIn profile, interview answers, but you, that goes across uh, your job search process. So your cover letter, any kind of networking conversations you have, everything uh, is going, you're going to be using the same approach to creating those materials. So let's go back to this concept of what's important to the employer. And I want to share something that is, that is hopefully, that hopefully offers a slightly different perspective from how you've been thinking about it. So when we think about our, our resumes, et cetera, we often look back at what we've done and that professional experience section becomes important. And it, because of that, often people think that employer really cares about what you've done in the past. And they do, but the only reason they care about what you've done in the past is because it's kind of the best way to approximate what you can do in the future. Realistically, all an employer cares about is what you can do for them in the role they're hiring for. If they could have an absolute guarantee that you can be successful in their role and they wouldn't have and they wouldn't have any access to the information about your past, they would hire you because what, again, what they care about is what you are going to be able to do for them, not what you've done in the past. So you need to, your, your job in the job search process is to explain to the employer what you can do for them. And you have two main tools to do that. You have skills and accomplishments. And we've already talked about skills quite a bit, so I'm not going to go through that again, but I do want to talk about accomplishments in more detail because that's really important. You might have realized by now I like definitions. So accomplishments is defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary as a successful result brought about by hard work. Accomplishments show what you did well. And what's important about accomplishments? Accomplishments are stories. They're individual situations where you went above and beyond, where you clearly did well. And you need to be able to tell those in a form of a story. People often get overwhelmed by the concept of accomplishments because they think that it needs to be something where, you know, you went out and you saved the world or saved the company. Um, but accomplishments don't necessarily have to be that big, right? It can be something minor. It can be something that, you know, you happen to come across a problem and you solved it in a timely manner. And maybe it wasn't a major problem, but maybe the problem has been around for two years and everybody just ignored it and you stepped up and you said, why not? and you fixed it. So think of accomplishments, sort of anything that you've done that you are really proud of. And um, I want to talk about this uh, framework, the STAR method for sharing your accomplishments in interviews. Because again, I want you to get in the framework of telling stories about what you've accomplished. And the STAR method, it's a very uh, common 
method for telling accomplishment stories in interviews. You can Google it. There are slightly different interpretations for each what each letter means, but the essence is always the same. So STAR method is a framework for telling a story that hits all of the most important points. And it stands for situation, which is context for the story, task, which is what you needed to accomplish, what was difficult about it, action, which is what you did you actually do, and the result, which was the outcome of your actions. And the result is actually very important also because, again, employers care about what the outcome is. And so um, the STAR method is usually recommended for uh, what's called behavioral interviews, right? So a behavioral interview, is, uh, interview question is a question that asks you to tell, explicitly asks you to tell a story. So for example, it can be something like, tell me about a time when you had to deal with a different customer with a difficult customer, I'm sorry. And maybe you previously worked at a restaurant. So here's a hypothetical example that is a great answer to this story. So tell me about a time when you had to deal with a difficult customer. I worked at a restaurant that was one of five restaurants owned by the same owner. And uh, there was a request to host a private parties. And you know, our, to be honest, our restaurant struggled at the time. Um, the request was for a Wednesday night, which is not at all a busy night. And uh, it was a big deal that we could host a big party because that was a good way to bring revenue for the restaurant. However, we did have one single table reservation for that night. So I needed to call that person and cancel the reservation. Didn't think that that was going to be a big deal. It turned out the person I was calling, got really frustrated. It was their anniversary and they had their first date at our restaurant and they really wanted to be there. And he wouldn't, you know, wasn't willing to sort of understand our situation and threatened uh, to post, report us to Better Business Bureau and post on Yelp, which as you can imagine, can be really good for, uh, really bad for the restaurant. So it was this big problem. Um, what I did is I talked to that person and I understood that what they're looking for is they were looking to kind of recreate their first date experience. I also recognize that there is a restaurant that uh, the same owners own that is actually has a very similar feel and they actually have the same menu. And so I was able to secure for this couple a table at this other restaurant and we did offer them a gift certificate, which made them very happy um, and had a little anniversary cake that I had arranged. Um, as a result, the couple was happy. We didn't end up with any negative reviews. And at the same time, we were able to host that big party to bring in a good you know, amount of cash. So this is an example of an accomplishment story in a behavioral interview context. And I encourage you to think about these situations, not only for behavioral interviews, right? Tell me about a time, but in context of interview, uh, interview questions that have to do with anything that shows your behavior. Like for example, if somebody asks you a hypothetical question, what would you do if you wanted a teammate, if you needed a teammate to do something, but they just wouldn't deliver? You can say, oh, you know, that actually happened to me. And I once needed to uh, launch a campaign. I needed an image that was, should be produced by the designer. And no matter how many times I think the designer, they completely understand they were overloaded and they wouldn't deliver the image to me. Yet that was, it was getting in the way and I was about to miss my deadline. So I ended up uh, sending an email to the designer and I CC'd my supervisor to, kind of, to uh, raise visibility. And I said, hey, um, thank you for the amazing work you've done so far. I know you've been super busy. Um, I just need to make sure that I, I know what the timeline is because this is my timeline. Um, can you let me know when this asset is going to be ready? Um, they responded because of course they, they saw it being escalated, but they didn't feel threatened because I addressed them in a very positive way. And as a result, the next day, the image came in and I was able to uh, launch my campaign on time. Again, um, a different example, but telling a story how you can achieve something that's difficult. 
And so I encourage you, as you're preparing for your job search, have like 20, 30 accomplishment stories ready to go. Think through everything that you've ever done that was difficult. Again, big accomplishment, but small ones as well. Because if you have, um, if you have those accomplishments, those examples ready, you're always going to be able to tell a story and stories resonate much better. And one th more thing that I want to point out is that there is, um, this is, we've talked about this um, STAR framework for the, uh, on interviews, but you can also use this on your resume and LinkedIn profile, et cetera. Just need to shorten it. And the best uh, way to do it is discuss result by action, right? Improved performance by 10% through introducing a new uh, customer registration flow or um, uh, raise $10,000 through organizing a grassroots fundraising campaign. So result by action is how you do it on your interview. Uh, I'm sorry, on your resume and LinkedIn profile. Okay, so in a more tactical way, we're getting uh, close here, but in a more tactical way, just keep in mind when you go to your resume and LinkedIn profile, again, step out of that binary uh, thinking that, you know, job, a job goes into professional experience, education goes into education. There is many more ways to communicate your skills and your accomplishments to the employer. So there are multiple sections that you can and should be utilizing. And those sections include summary statement. I'll show you an example in a minute. Skills section. Again, I'll show you an example. Projects that are kind of similar to your professional experience. Um, accomplishments go under your professional experience or wherever they belong, right? They can go under projects as well. And then of course, your education. So this is an example of a summary statement. A summary statement at the top is a summary statement from LinkedIn. It's about, it's a little bit longer. Uh, the second summary statement is an example of su summary statement on a resume, it's longer. But again, you see, it's calling out specific skills and specific abilities. You don't have to wait uh, until your experience section to share that. Skills section, super important section because it points out to employers what you can do for them. Also skills are great because especially technical skills are highly searchable. So on your resume, you can have that skill section. Uh, there are a couple of different formats here at the top. On LinkedIn, you absolutely can be can and should be using those skills into your summary as well but there is a separate skill section that you should organize and manage and those are keywords that recruiters might be using for to discover you and then accomplishments again we've talked about accomplishments we've talked about how to position them on on your resume how to use that um, and so here's some example, right? Introduced employee online review reward program resulting in over 70 positive reviews in four months, right? So it's action, I'm sorry, it's action resulting in result. Or like received certificate of excellence for success at upselling to customers, right? Result by action. So those are really good ways to tell your accomplishment stories. To summarize, to, in order to get your first job, you need to close that gap in connecting yourself to the role you're looking for. To do that, make sure you start with understanding the job and then identify what it is that you want to communicate to the employer, what is relevant for the employer, and then clearly communicate uh, that value proposition through skills and accomplishments on your resume. I'm going to jump into uh, the Q&A in just a second, but before that, I do that, I just wanted to tell you that you are amazing, um, you are unique. I know you're here and therefore you care. I know you have great skills. I know you've done amazing things in your life. It's a matter of communicating that to employers, and you can absolutely do that if you follow the tips that I had shared today. So thank you so much for being here. And I am now going to answer a few questions.
let me just go to my Q and A and see what we have in there. Okay. Um, Second. A lot of a uh, lot of wonderful questions in here. So let's let's start with how can I boost my resume? Uh, great question. Uh, talked about this already today a little bit. Again, make sure to incorporate everything that you've done. Uh, make sure, again, to identify, talk to potential employers, read job description, talk to industry professionals, understand what's important to them. There is no blanket answer to this question, so talk to employers, understand what's important to them, and then, um, and then go and find a way to, to develop that skill. Again, Coursera, can be a great solution for a lot of these skills. Maybe you need certain experience. You can always start with an employer. Um, great question. Um, my question is, do reference letters really matter in terms of telling your employer your success in the past? It's a wonderful question. Now, one caveat there is there uh, kind of might vary slightly depending on where you are um, in the world. However, in general, reference letter require a lot of work on the employer side. Reading reference letter requires a lot of work on the employer side. Essentially, when you rely on reference letter, what you are what you're telling the employer is, you know, I can't, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let other people speak for me. And that is an extra step in the, in the process for the employer, right? They have to read your resume, and then they have to pull up additional information, see what other people have to say about you. And then those other people clearly um, might not know what role you're using those reference letters for. And therefore, they might not be talking about the things that are most relevant to the employer. So think of reference letters as good supporting information, maybe at later stages of interviews. But when you're first starting, you're making first connection with the employer, make sure that you can clearly communicate your value yourself. Where do you add a Coursera certificate in the resume? I love that question, of course, because I work at Coursera. Coursera certificate, any other certificate? Again, same as we discussed today. You, on a resume, you generally have an education or a certificate section. You can definitely add it there. However, again, think about the skills and think about the importance of that certificate on your resume. So. Uh, other places where you can add, make sure you add skills into the skills section. You always develop skills through uh, Coursera certificates, so make sure to add them to the skills section. If it's something that is significant to your job search, for example, you are changing careers or you're looking for your first job in IT support, don't have a bachelor degree, um, and you don't have much relevant experience, but you completed Google IT support certificate on Coursera, that is a really important uh, Point for the employer to know, and this is a really important part of uh, information for you to share with the employer. You can add it straight into your summary, right? Or you can even add it. There is a you can add a little headline at the top of your resume, right? And you can say um, "IT support specialist, Google IT support certificate." So there is a lot of think of think of how important that information is for the employer. What is important about that information, and then look at your resume how you where you can incorporate it. Can you please speak about personal branding? Oops. Uh, just personal, uh, sorry, I lost that question for a second. Can you please talk about personal branding? What are the best ways to get noticed? Online portfolio and such. 
Fantastic question. There is uh, the term personal branding gets thrown a lot, around a lot. Um, it means so many different things. But fundamentally, personal branding is exactly what we talked about today, right? Personal branding is what it is that is important for employer to know about you. You uh, and personal branding is usually more condensed, right? It's not whole lot of information, but it's something at a high level. So what I recommend is as you're going through your job search, right, as you go through that exercise and identify what you need an employer to know about you, go ahead and think about if there is an employer who you want to work for um, and they don't know anything about you, they don't have any uh, questions, uh, I'm sorry, they don't have access to your resume, there is, they haven't seen you, they haven't heard you, what are the three things that you want that employer to know about you? So maybe you want them to know that you um, completed a certificate on Coursera, that you have experience in customer service, and that you are known as the go-to person for all tech questions in your family, right? That kind of is going to describe you as a professional in IT support, for, um, for example. Think about your personal brand. What are the three most important things for the employer to know? And then you organize everything else around those three most important points. That's really uh, what personal branding is. Um, I think the question also had some uh, references to the portfolio. Um, yes, that can be a part of your personal brand. Um, that can be a part of your personal brand, but uh, it's only for certain roles. Like if you're in UI, UX design, you'll need a portfolio, right? If you're an engineer, you don't need a portfolio. Another question, uh, do soft skills have to be mentioned on your CV resume or do you bring that up during an interview? Great question. Again, going to depend on the role, a role that is very heavy on soft skills. Uh, for example, again, um, customer service relies heavily on soft skills. Yes, you will absolutely want to communicate your soft skills on your resume. Again, remember that soft skills, a lot of people are going to claim those soft skills. So make sure you back that up and for, uh, back that up with information that shows that you indeed have excellent soft skills. Um, other roles that are more technical roles, for example, right? Maybe uh, you are going to be in a role, um, say a, um, a technician role, and you're going to mostly be working with hardware on your own. Tech, your soft skills are still going to be important, but they're going to be less important than your technical skills. In that case, you might or might not communicate your soft skills. I would say communicate your soft skills if this is really like, again, one of those three points that are important about you, right? If you uh, think that you have technical skills that sets you apart and make you a better candidate, then still communicate them. Let's go to our next question. One second. Can we use cold emails to get ourselves out there? Absolutely. Uh, what I had shared about LinkedIn and how you can send messages to people you don't know. Yes, you can do that. Um, I'm a big fan of quality over quantity, but quantity counts as well. Yes, you. It's when you're looking for your first job, your network is going to be very important. And chances are you don't have a huge relevant network. So any way you have to connect with more people, but connect in genuine way, right? Connect in a way where they want to speak with you and where uh, you build a connection where they want to help you is going to be helpful. How to identify that we have successfully found the best fit job? I'm going to go back to the answer I've given before. Talk to professionals. Um, also keep in mind that uh, there probably isn't the perfect job for you. Don't, don't worry if it's not perfect. Again, think about, I'm going to go back to the number three, think about the three most important things 
in a job for you and find a job that meets those requirements, especially if you're early in your career and you're looking for your first job, you're not committing for the rest of your life. And therefore, uh, it's okay if you pick a job that is going to be a stepping stone to something else for you. Great, um, I'm really excited to see that many questions coming in, but I'm also aware of our timeline and we just have, we have two minutes to go. So I'm going to take one more question. Okay, what are the points not to miss in a cover letter? Going to address that one because it's an important one. So the thing about cover letter is cover letter has a unique purpose in the job search process. Your resume talks about you. The job description talks about the job. Cover letter is the only place where you can connect the dots between yourself and the job. So first point is do not write a generic cover letter. Anything that is generic can probably be built into your resume. Make sure that in your cover letter, you make a very specific case how your exact experience and skill set meets the needs of this specific job. Also, if you have any kind of uh, situation that you can't explain in a resume, you have a resume gap, for example, um, or you're changing career, that's worth putting in your cover letter. But again, not in a generic way, always make sure that you connect your experience and skill set to the job you're applying for. Great. Um, I know uh, that there is more questions. I'm really uh, appreciative of all the questions you're asking. I hope that what I had shared is helpful. Um, what I'm going to suggest is on this slide, you can see my email address. So feel free to drop me a note. I will do my best to answer your question or refer you to the right resource. Thank you so much for joining today.